Morning, church. Trust you are doing well this morning. Um, I know I am. My name is Brandon Ziski, lead pastor here at Austin Oaks Church. If you're a guest visiting with us this morning, we want you to know who we are as a church. We're a church that strives to be simply all about Jesus because we believe that when you encounter him, it changes everything. So we want to make much of him. We want to build every foundation in our lives off of him. So two quick things before we jump into the message this morning. One, at 1230 today, in the Oaks room right out here, we're um, providing free lunch. It's an Israel meeting, so just I'm trying to bait you to come. Okay, so um, if you're interested in hearing a little bit about the trip that we took in July, and I'll also hear about our upcoming trip uh, in July, tw- uh, July of 2020, I want to encourage you to come to that. It's going to be right there, 1230. Um, if, you if you had an RSVP or not, that's totally fine. would encourage you to come check it out. Um, secondly, again, um, is if you're walking in and maybe you weren't with us last week, you're like, whoa, wait, wait a second, what happened to the other worship songs? We flipped the order of our worship here on a Sunday morning because of how we're now staggering our worship services. So, so 11 o'clock, we're going to do two services and then there's going to be a message and then we're going to spend time responding in song for three songs. So again, if people are walking in, um, probably expecting to have a song going on. Let's grace them. Let's be gentle to them. Let me embarrass them. You don't have to. I'll do it. And so we'll go from there. I'm just kidding. As people are walking in, you're like, that's not funny. <laughs> so we are in week two of this sermon series called Church for Monday. And the heartbeat of this series is to make us wrestle with the thought of how do we live out our faith in all the days between Sundays, Right? We understand that church is more than Sunday, but however, culturally speaking, we tend to think that if I go to church on Sunday, I am a Christian, and so that's all it is. And a lot of times we start to think that the end-all, be-all is what happens on Sunday, but when we look at scriptures, we begin to understand that really the mission of the church, the mission of the gospel is happening more outside of what happens on Sunday. We all have 168 hours in a week. We spend roughly one hour, maybe two hours a week in church. That means there's 167, 166 hours that we have to live for Jesus outside of Sunday. And so we need to start asking this question. What does it look like to be a church for Monday? And when we use the word Monday, we're basically talking about everything that defines your life, right? Your school, your workplace, um, your hobbies, your recreational activities, your relationships, all of the things that happen outside of a Sunday is what we define as Monday. Last week, we were talking about what our primary calling is. We looked at Ephesians chapter 4, and we saw that Paul was saying, it's like, I urge you to walk in a manner that is worthy or equal to the calling to which you received. And so we see Paul already just saying, listen, the way you live your life needs to have equal value to the gospel, to how Jesus lived and what he did for you. Which means, it has to mean, it's far beyond what happens here on a Sunday morning. It has to include every aspect of life. And so that's why we said that your primary calling is not your job. is not your relationships. It's primarily a follower of Jesus. And all of these other things, your passions, where you work, the relational context that you're in, those are all the arenas where we live out our primary calling of following Jesus. And that's where we understood that church is more than just Sunday. So if you could, I want to encourage you to stand with me as we read and honor the word of the Lord. Um, Because I believe this morning, this message this morning, as you're going to discover, is a very popular message. Right? It's a message that we've heard. If you've been in the church world, you've probably heard the phrases and all these things. And I want to encourage you to hear it for the first time. Okay? To just kind of set aside the way you've interpreted this passage, the way you, you've tried to wrestle with this. Just, I want you to hear it as if you were a follower of Jesus in this context that Jesus spoke this. So if you could, turn with me to John, or not John, Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, verses 18 through 20 and 23 through 25. Now it happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him. And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but others say Elijah and others, the one of the prophets of old has risen. And then he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Verse 23. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. 
Well, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? And Father, we ask that this morning, first and foremost, that you would be our teacher, that you would be our guide, you would be the light to illuminate the dark areas in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would give us the courage to honestly assess our hearts. And Lord, I also pray that by your grace, you would give us a glimpse, a picture of what it would look like to follow Jesus on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, and all the moments in between. So Lord, we say, here we are. Speak, we're listening. In Christ's name, amen. You can take a seat. Now, I'm gonna start out this morning by making a confession. And I know I can make this confession in confidence because I know, one, I trust you. Two, because you're just like me. I tend to compartmentalize my faith, right? There's moments where I'm just like, you know what? At this moment, I'm going to turn on my faith. I'm going to turn off my faith. Not saying that like, I don't follow Jesus or I don't believe in Jesus. It's just that I'm not actively trying to follow him in certain moments, right? So it's like, kind of like, a, a, like going to work. Like I'll punch in and punch out. Like it's so easy for me. Like, for instance, my job, since I'm a paid vocational minister, it's easy for me to go, I'm a Christian when I'm at work, but when I get home, I'm punching out, and I don't necessarily want to intentionally engage my neighbors. And so I'm going to kind of take a back seat, not to say I don't love Jesus, but I'm not going to be looking for opportunities to love and to serve. And so I compartmentalize my faith. So I do this probably the most when I get on airplanes. Okay, I don't know what it is about me, but there's just something inside of me that goes, I don't want to be that stereotypical person that gets on an airplane and finds my captive audience and I have to evangelize that person. Like I just, I just, there's something about it, even though I know it's a great opportunity and it's an opportunity where I just say, Lord, use me and I should engage him. But for some reason, I just choose not to. I would rather put my headphones on and just read or work or whatever it is and just kind of veg out. Now, it's probably because I've had a few awkward moments on airplanes where that started to solidify. So, for instance, um, since my job is a pastor and you start to have small talk with people and you get to that spot where you go, what do you do for a living? And then all of a sudden I go, I'm a pastor. And they immediately go, oh. And you just know, like, they're not really thrilled to be sitting next to a pastor because they're like, is he going to judge me by what I'm going to watch and all this kind of stuff? And so then there's, like, these awkward moments of small talk, and next thing you know, they put their noise cancellation headphones on, and there you go, the rest of your flight. Now, a few years ago when I was in Minnesota, I had an opportunity to speak at a conference in New Orleans, and I wasn't fully ready for my message, and so I was like, I need this time on the plane to prepare my stuff. And so I was like, I'm not going to engage. I'm just going to open up my laptop and work. And when I got to Atlanta, I had a layover. And as I was walking off the gates and moving towards our other gate, I just felt like the Lord put it on my heart. Brandon, I want you to share your story with whoever you sit next to. And I was just like, uh-huh, okay. You know, like I just, like I didn't want to. And I was just like, ah, oh, that's just me just trying to be super Christian or whatever it is. And so it just kept coming and kept coming. So I got to the gate. I sat down opened up my laptop, and, and it just kept coming at me. It's just like, Brandon, I want you to be open and willing to share your faith with whoever you sit next to you. So as I was wrestling with that, I'm overhearing this, this very vulgar conversation. I look over to my left, and there's this guy, I, I kid you not, he had to been like six foot seven, looked like he was like Paul Bunyan, like just big, burly, hairy guy, and he's on the phone, and there's like this, this cuss storm just around him, and he is just reaming out whoever's on the other side of that phone. And there's a bunch of kids around him, and so I gave him a really nasty look, right? So I'm just like, I was like, dude, you know? And so uh, as I was waiting there for the board to plane, I start walking down the aisle of the plane, and God's like, okay, Brandon, I want you to share your faith with whoever you're going to sit next to. And lo and behold, I sat next to Mr. Swears. And I was just like, and I, and I like, kid you not, I sat down and I immediately said to myself, not happening. <laughs> I, just, I just turned it off. I was like, nope, not going to. I know how this is going to work. He's going to either make fun of me, he's going to swear at me, or it's just going to go bad. So I was just like, I'm not doing it. The plane takes off about 15 minutes into the flight. He leans over, and he just pulls out his phone. And he goes, hey, look at this. And I was just like, yeah. You know, it just scared me. And it was a picture of him catching this large muskie 
And he proceeded to tell me about his fishing trip up in Minnesota. We are having these small talk conversations. And next thing you know, I was just like, okay, Lord, I see that you want me to talk with him. And so he goes, what do you do for a living? And I, and I, went, and I went, I don't know, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I was just like, and he's like, you know, I run a construction company and da-da-da. I was like, okay. He's like, no, what do you do? I was like, well, I'm a pastor. He goes, really? So tell me about that. You know, then he started asking me questions about my faith and things like that and how he sees church. And I was like, okay, I'm going to try to find an opportunity to share the gospel with him because, like, he was, a, you know, cultural church Christian, didn't really necessarily follow Jesus, doesn't understand it. I was like, so what defines you as a Christian? He's like, oh, you just got to be good enough and all these kind of things. I was like, okay. So I was trying trying to tell him my story. And it just kept, he kept interrupting me. He would swear over me. It's just nonstop, nonstop, stop. And I was getting super frustrated. And I was like, okay, I need a break. Because I couldn't get more than like five words out at a time. So I went up, walked to the restroom, and I was just praying. I was like, Lord, this is ridiculous. This is a waste of time. I got a message to prepare. You don't understand. I'm going to be this. I'm going to look foolish. I get back to my seat. He gets up and he goes to the restroom. And as he gets up and he goes to the restroom, the person in front of me stands up leans over to see and looks at me and goes, I know your dad. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, you know Russell Ziski? And I was like, how do you know him? I started asking this question. She's like, no, 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 no. I know your dad. <laughs> to, to, to which at that point I went, ooh. I was like, corny, whatever. But nonetheless, he met well. And so like he proceeded to me, he's like, listen, I want you to know that I felt like God wanted me to tell you that he's proud of you just for trying, just to give in your effort and all that kind of stuff. And I sat there and I was reflecting on this passage and that situation. And I was just like, Lord, why do I do this? Why do I choose when I'm on or when I'm off? God, when do I, why do I choose when it's convenient to follow you or when it's inconvenient to follow you? Lord, why, why do I feel like it's, like, I want you to follow me instead of me following you? And it just dawned on me. I was like, this is the heartbeat of what it means to be a church for Monday. If our primary calling is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, listen, a disciple who is ready for Monday is one who takes up their cross. This means everything, every moment, every decision, every action is underneath the loving authority of Jesus Christ. There is not a moment where we can just kind of punch in and punch out. There's not a moment where we define the terms of what it means to be a Christian and not a Christian. If we're going to be a church for Monday, and if we're going to understand that our primary calling is to follow Jesus, we have to carry our cross, not just here, but on Monday. That's what it means to be a church for Monday. And I understand this is, this is hard. This is really hard. Because there's so many things that just hit us on Monday morning. Like I was just thinking about my Monday and how quickly it was easy, even after I preached the message, how Monday, we got to be ready to follow Jesus on Monday, on Monday, on Monday. Monday came. And yes, I hit snooze three times. Yes. And it was just so easy to go, okay, what do I got to do today? What's my agenda like? What's my schedule like? Da, 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 da. And then you start thinking about all the things that influence me and me, 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 me. And next thing you know, you're no longer looking for opportunities to love God, to grow, or to necessarily find opportunities to serve. Now this phrase, carry your cross, I mean, it's a very churchy phrase, right? Like it's a phrase that is very unique to Christians, but a lot of times we use it in the vernacular out there like, oh, I'm just carrying my cross. But what does that even mean to carry your cross? And so I, I came up with a simple definition for us. And it's simply this. It means, to, it means that your life is no longer your own. When you think about carrying your cross, you're in effect saying my life is not mine. It's, it's not mine. Like, you can understand, in the context of where this passage was said, if you were carrying your cross, you have no control or say over the direction of your life because it's heading in one direction, execution. So when we say carry your cross, you're in effect saying, my life is no longer mine. Everything, everything is completely and totally given to Jesus. And that's why this is hard. How does this statement feel to you? Like, just like think about that. Like, be honest. When you think about this, that every aspect of your life, everything, relationships, your finances, your job, 
your vocation, your dreams, your aspiration, your time, your margin, everything. Like, how does that really feel? I don't know if he really means it. Like, I think it's just kind of a sentiment. He wants us to try this or that. It's like, no, it's everything. The entirety, the entirety of your life is to be lived out with Jesus and for Jesus. It's to be lived with Jesus and for him. You can't carry your cross. You can't follow this path on your own. You don't gut it out on your own. It's with him. He gives us the spirit to empower us to live this life out. He's the one who causes us to desire and to act in accordance to his will. And it's for him. Everything is for him. So here's a very profound statement, okay? This is going to be one of those like really wise nuggets of Brandon, which is really not a wise nugget. It's more like a duh thing. But I want to encourage you to write it down because it's really good. Monday's not about you. It's about Jesus. Now, it's as cutesy as it sounds, like, think about it for a moment. Your Monday, your Tuesday, your Wednesday, it's about Him. If your primary calling is to follow Jesus, which means a disciple, and a disciple is basically at its core a student, a learner, an apprentice, one who follows a master, if that's our call, that means when you get up on Monday, your schedule, your priorities, everything that comes at you is not about you. It's ultimately about Him. And everything that you find yourself doing on a Monday and a Tuesday is the arena or the context by which you follow Jesus in. It's not about you. It's all about Him. And that's why I want us to really slow down and think about this passage and embrace these words that Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Because as you read this, like you're going to see, like the way Jesus talks about being a follower is really the definition of being a Christian. And he just draws this line in the sand. He's like, if you're going to follow me, here's what it means to follow me. In other words, like let's think about this way. Here's the job description of being a disciple. This is what they do. And this is what they look like. So, I hope this is hard for you. <laughs> that sounds really odd to say. But I, I, I hope this, you start to feel a tension this morning. All week long as I was prepping this, I was like, gosh, man, this is hard. And I remember even telling the, the staff on Tuesday going, man, I wrote in my notes, this feels ridiculous. Like this feels like, like way too much. Because there's a lot of things here that Jesus wants to wrestle with. And I want us to think about this way. Monday at the core of it is where we battle ourselves. Monday comes and we have to make the decision to get out of the throne. Monday comes and we got to remove ourselves as like the sole determiner of everything. We got to learn to not lean on our understanding but on his. This is where the battle comes. It's on Monday where we have to struggle with being faithful to Jesus. It's on Monday where we have to wrestle with, am I sent or not? Right? It's Monday where we struggle with being open with our faith. It's Monday where we're going to struggle in certain contexts and conversations where we need to stand up for the truth, where our faith and work are going to intersect. It's Monday. It's those moments. Like right now, it's like, yeah, we might battle ourselves, but here there's going to be a lot of just thinking and wrestling and processing. But at the end of the day, it's not where you're going to be applying things. It's where you live this out. And that's why we see in verse 23, Jesus saying, if anyone, if anyone, if you want to follow me, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It's not just once. Like you don't just choose one time, like I'm carrying my cross, I made that decision once, we're all good. You no, know, this is a daily thing. We got to choose this. Like we read this and we go, oh, cross. Okay, I understand it. You know, it's where Jesus died. It was the crucifixion thing. It was rough. But like, listen, we don't understand the way that was communicated. Like we don't feel 
at the same way the disciples would have felt this. Like the cross was an object of shame, complete embarrassment, shame and guilt and ridicule. It was repulsive. It was the place where the Romans would execute the worst of the worst. And the fact that you would say is like if you're hung on a tree, and the Old Testament says you were cursed by God. And Jesus is saying, it's like, if you want to follow me, you need to carry this object that is repulsive to you. We go, oh, you need to carry your cross. and that, uh, This is like, this is a big deal. If you are going to do this, someone's going to lead you to your death. Like, this statement is like, listen, you can't be friends with the world anymore. Like, the values and aspirations and the lifestyles of this world are no longer compatible with the kingdom of God. You can't just go, well, I'm going to follow Jesus here, but this part of my life, off limits, can't do that. This means, like, this, like I know there's going to be some redundancy here, but a reason why I'm doing this is because I want to just drive this home. This means that we need to boldly declare, if we are going to carry a cross, we need to boldly declare that everything about me is now placed under him. His authority, his wisdom, his love, his direction. He has rights. He has rights over your career, family, time, education, body, relationships, sexuality, finances, dare I say, politics, entertainment, everything. He has rights over it all. And this is exactly why many of us would choose to embrace church for Sunday. Because it's easier. Because, right, Monday is where we battle ourselves. It's Monday where these things really show up. In fact, I would say there's a, a common sentiment amongst general Christianity that would say something kind of along these lines. Like, I will follow you, Jesus, Provided that you don't make my life too uncomfortable, that you don't make my reputation too questionable, you don't make my job too difficult, you don't make my hobbies too minimal, or make my values too countercultural, then I'll follow you. We would rather have Jesus follow us than us follow him. But it's not what Jesus says. Like, if anyone would come after me, here's the line you gotta deny yourself and carry your cross. Then you follow me. This creates a tension, doesn't it? I mean, like, this is what I said. It's like, I want this to be difficult. This should create a tension right now in your life. This creates a tension inside of us that we so often want to try to ignore. Like, we would rather just ignore it than embrace it. Oh, yeah, he wants to carry your cross. But he's like, no, no, no. You need to investigate the areas in your life where you're choosing to not to. Right? Like, so for instance, in the first two services, I said, let's, let's just get a little bit personal here. Let's start talking about this. Let's talk about how we carry our cross or follow the way of Jesus, deny ourselves when it comes to our finances. There should be a tension there. And how you live your life, let's say after work, at happy hour with the friends. Or maybe it's the weekend and you're just going to let loose a little bit and you, you go to ACL and... Not a, not a judgment ACL. But you know what I'm saying. Like there's moments where we're just like, there's a tension here, but yeah, that's not what he meant. And we just try to minimize it. We go, you know what, that's good. I'll live this way and I'll go to church on Sunday. I'll recalibrate my life and we'll be good to go on Monday again. And there we go. He wants us to wrestle with every facet of our lives so that everything in our lives is willingly underneath the loving authority of Jesus Christ. This is where the rubber hits the road. Now, I wanted to talk about this because I know there's confusion here on this, like what is a cross and what's not a cross because a lot of times in like counseling, I'll hear people go, you know, Brandon, um, uh, let, me, let me back up a little bit. I don't want to sound cold-hearted when I say this. Like, I'm not minimizing difficulties and trials and struggles and all those types of things, but we need to understand the difference between what a cross is and what a difficulty is, okay? So it's like if, if things just happen in your life, like a sickness or an illness or other just hard things happen, people hurt you or whatever, just difficulties of life because life is broken and sinful and hard, those aren't crosses. 
Those are difficulties. Those are thorns. Those are hardships. What Jesus is talking about really here is like carrying the cross for the sake of choosing to follow Jesus. Like if, if you face difficulty because you've chosen to follow Jesus and it's causing you to stand countercultural or people are going to look at you differently or you're going to choose to act in a different way and the problems or difficulties come as a result, that's the cross. I would have people come be like, you know, Brandon, I, I'm just, I'm so sick and maybe the sickness is just the flu and they go, this is my cross to bear. It's like, no, it's just the flu. It's hard. It's difficult. yes. Hardships are difficult and we have the Holy Spirit as our comforter and he wants to lead a peace, not minimizing it, but it's not the cross that Jesus is talking about. This is the way of following Jesus, to be open no matter what. And if our vocation is discipleship, we can understand that Jesus said in John 17, right? He tell, he, he's praying for his disciples and he's saying, it's like, they're not of the world just as I'm not of the world. The world hates them just as they hated me. It's like, Father, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, but that you would protect them from the evil one. Then he says, like, sanctify them by truth. As you have sent me, John 17, 18, as you have sent me, I am sending them. Right now, if you are a follower of Jesus, you got to understand that you are sent Your lives are meant to be on mission. Your primary calling is to follow Jesus. And you do that in all of the other arenas where your secondary and tertiary callings find themselves. That's what it means. That's why Monday is the tension that we have to embrace. Extremely hard. As I was um, researching some things this week, I stumbled across... Um, a poll that the Atlantic did. And it was fascinating because they wanted to know, because they always, you know, when it comes around to political seasons and all this stuff, they always want to know what the approval ratings are of the president and all this kind of stuff. And so they decided, hey, let's, let's, let's change this. Instead of finding out what the latest approval rating is of uh, this, the, present, the president, let's find out how Americans um, approve themselves. What would be the approval rating of someone that they would place on themselves? Do you know what the answer would be? Do you know what the, the average approval rating that we would give ourselves is? Take a shot in the dark. This, this is a good time to interact. Come on. I mean, it's, it's pretty fascinating. 93%. Yay us! We should run for president. You have a better approval rating than Jesus. How about that? This is why this is hard. Carry your cross, deny yourself. Instinctively, we think we're doing a good job. Like, why, God, I don't need you to speak into my finances. I mean, for the most part, it's good. I mean, there's a few things that are bad. There's a few things that I might spend some money on that I shouldn't have, you know, but that's okay. But for the most part, it's good. God, I don't need you to speak into this or that because I, I can handle it pretty well. Like, I'm just going to lean on my own understanding. I'm going to try to figure this my own way because we think rather highly of ourselves. So we hear the word, carry your cross, deny yourself. Instinctively, it just rubs us wrong because we think we're pretty good. But we can understand we're not. In fact, Jesus even says, like, listen, when you try to hang on to your life, when you try to save your life, when you try to do life your own way, like it says in verse 24, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life for my sake, says Jesus, then you will find it. What will it profit someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? But why is it that we still try to live life this way? Like, God, I'm going to... I, I, I'm going to follow you, but really what I'm saying is I want you to follow me. And um, dear, can we work with that? And, and it's, it's very clear. Jesus is like, listen, if you're trying to live your life this way and you're trying to hang on to everything, you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lay it all down and carry your cross for my sake, you will find it. 
I mean, this is hard because we think that when we deny ourselves, we're giving up so many things. Like life is going to be miserable. I'm never going to have fun. I'm never going to have joy. I'm never going to get what I want to get and all these types of things. And he's just going to be this guy who just rains on my parade all the time. But he's just like, no, that's not it. You can understand the opposite is true. When you try to hang on, you're going to lose everything. We got to understand this, that like denying yourself is not really losing yourself. We think it is. That if I deny myself and I carry my cross, I'm losing myself. I'm losing who I am and, I'm, and there's no one going to take care of me. But the opposite is true. When you lose yourself, when you deny yourself, you're actually finding yourself. Because you can only truly find yourself when you see yourself in Jesus. So let's reflect for a moment. As we enter into our Monday life, do we see everything about us every person we interact with, every place we enter, every task we complete, every decision we make as an opportunity to say, I am living my life for Jesus and not for myself. Or do we just see everything come Monday as just things I gotta do and it's about me and my schedule and my priorities? Because here's the reality. Monday, at the end of the day, is where we risk everything. We're not risking much here. We're not, we're not risking much coming to church. Like, think about it. When Jesus says, if you lose yourself, you will gain. That word loss, that's a risk. Think about the areas that you're not willing to open up to God. Think about the areas where you're like, God, this is off limits. You don't want God to speak into those areas. I know you have them. I know you have them. There's spots in your life where you're like, God, I don't want you to speak into it because I don't want to hear what you're calling me to. So we hold it back. That's the risk. There might be moments where he's like, you need to stand up for me in the workplace, in the classroom. You need to speak up against that friend who's always being racist against his neighbors and all these other stuff. Or whatever it is, what, you know, being in, full of integrity in the workplace or the boss is asking you to do something you know, kind of sketchy and you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. You don't risk much here, but listen, on Sunday, rhetorically, you're answering the question, will I risk everything for him? And the answer is, on Monday is where you're going to show that answer. When you walk out of these doors, that's when you're going to decide if you're going to risk it or not. And here's what I know to be true. There is a direct correlation to how much we risk for Jesus and how much we understand the gospel. There's a direct correlation there. And that's why we say around here all the time, you've got to preach the gospel to yourself because we risk much in response to. When we look at Jesus and what he did, he gave it all. He came to live the life that we should have like, lived. He died for my sins so that I could have life. He conquered death so that I could be free and have the power to live. When I look at that, I go, man, how could I not? How could I continue to walk and live my life and say, Lord, no, from 9 to 7, 30 p.m., I will follow you, but from then on, my old time. Everything is under him. And that's why I love this passage, because when Jesus spoke this verse about following him and denying yourself and carrying your cross, it comes on the heels of verse 18 and 19 and 20 where Jesus was speaking, right, to the crowd, and he says, guys, guys, who do, who, who do people say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? Like, this, this is easy to answer this question. Like, there is no cost involved in answering this question. Like, like when I was at ACL a couple of weekends, or not this weekend, but last weekend, and just thinking about this, I was like, who do people say that I am? Like, if I were to ask people, I could answer this question easily. We all could. When we think about the crowds, we could all speak for them. Easy. But then Jesus turns it around, right? As they're answering, he goes, no, no, okay, but who do you say that I am? And some of you are like, Brandon, why do we always talk about this passage? Because you never graduate beyond this question. You never graduate beyond this question, church. Like, you should always wrestle with this question, but you don't move on beyond this question. Who do you say that I am? Because here, here's the reality. It's easy to answer that question here on Sunday. But the real answer shows up 
on Monday. Right? Because Monday is where we really say who Jesus is. Because if he is the Christ, if he is Lord, well then how does that affect how I live? How does that influence my decisions? My relationships? My time? attention it's not one that we're meant to ignore but can we be honest for a moment we in America can make a decision to follow Jesus and not feel rejected immediately we can, we can say we follow Jesus and really be on, off the radar nobody can really know well, we've created an institution where it's so easy to build a Christian bubble, wrapped in bubble wrap, secluded from the world, not feel any of the challenge or feel even uncomfortable. But when you hear this language of carrying your cross, you're like, how comfortable am I really supposed to be? If I understand what it means to follow Jesus and if I understand he says you're supposed to live sent, like, like I'm not taking you out of the world, but you're supposed to be in the world, like is there a difference? Like if Jesus says, follow me, carry your cross, like to what end? For what purpose? So I want us to wrestle with two questions. And we can use this time in our worship, the next few songs, just to, I want you to wrestle with this question because I don't want to just talk and you guys just go, oh yeah, that was, that was challenging. Like I really want you to answer these two questions and go, this is what it means. This is what it would look like in my life. The first question is simply this. What happens when Monday is all about me? What does Monday look like when it's all about me? We had a fun conversation as a staff on this question, and it was sobering. And we heard things about like anxious striving to using people to get ahead. I mean, we were just trying to be real honest. What does Monday look like when it's all about you? This is where I, I'm asking that we be courageous and just be truthful. And the second question is where I'm praying that God would grace us with a vision of what it could look like. What does Monday look like when it's all about Jesus? What does it look like? You see, church, I, I'm convinced that our city doesn't need another church for Sunday. Our city needs to see a church for Monday. Because we come here for an hour, and this is important. For 2,000 years, the church has always come together on Sunday to be rooted in God's love, to celebrate Jesus, to be reminded of who he is, and then we're to be sent out into this world where we boldly declare that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that we are going to live a life that demands an answer. Because here's the part and Jesus continued, and I wasn't able to get to it this morning, but he says, listen, he's like, whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Do you know how we can live passionately following Jesus on Monday? Remember who you say, say he is. Remember that he is the king of kings and that he loves you. He gave his life for you and that there's others out there in this world that need to know him and to see his beauty and his glory and his majesty. So as we sing now, like let this be an opportunity to just do work with the spirit. And this is a great song just to be like, all hail King Jesus. 
Lord, how does that shape how I live? How does that change my perspective? Would you join me in prayer? Father, I thank you for your word that is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Just, it just gets right to it. Lord, I thank you that this definition of what it means to be a Christian, to deny self, carry a cross, and follow you, is not meant to make us feel guilty. It's not meant to shame us or to make us feel like we continue to fall short. But it's really meant to inspire joy and life and hope, direction, movement. There's so much grace and mercy layered in this. So, Father, I just pray that you would calibrate our hearts. Lord, would you help us to answer these questions truthfully, honestly, motivated by your grace? Lord, I ask that as we leave here, we leave here determined to deny ourselves, to carry our cross, to be ready for Monday, to say yes to you in all things. We pray this in Christ's name.